Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg, and thank you to Trevor and to his colleagues for inviting me tonight to talk about... Well, I'm going to plug the book again, sorry. <laughs> uh, to talk about Eamon de Valera. Now, nobody would deny, uh, as Greg has, has mentioned, that Eamon de Valera was by far the dominant figure in Irish politics in the first half of the 20th century. And I don't think anybody would deny either that he was one of the most controversial and one of the most divisive. And that was um, brought home to me when I invited my colleagues to the, the launch of the book and... Uh, one of them sidled up to me and said, well, I hope you blame him for the Civil War. <laughs> now, bear in mind, I was trying to sell books, so I said, well, we're up to a point. So she went off happy. And then another one sidled up to me and said, he gets a terrible his press, you know, I hope you set the record straight. <laughs> well, up to a point. So he went away happy as well. Um, very important to uh, keep uh, the audience happy. Now, clearly, De Valera is such a controversial figure that if you try and be even-handed, you're probably not going to satisfy either those who love him or those who loathe him. But it, I think it's important to try because without understanding his motivations, without understanding what drove him, uh, we can't really understand the history of 20th century Ireland. And what's really extraordinary about his rise to dominance is that he came from very humble beginnings and yet managed to rise to a position of national leadership by 1917. And after the treaty split and the civil war, when he lost his preeminent position and seemed to be politically finished, he clawed his way back in one of the great political comebacks. Now, you can think of political Lazarus acts, you can think of uh, Churchill, you can think of Nixon, you can think of Charlie Hawhey, uh, who uh, is, is well represented upstairs, but none of them really compare to Amy <coughs> de Valera. Now, uh, most of us with any memory of de Valera think of him as an old man, which is understandable. Uh, he finally left the Taoiseach's office when he was 76. Uh, he finished his second term as Taoiseach at the age of 90. Uh, but I want to talk this evening about De Valera's youth, about his background and the life that shaped him, that formed his character and that allowed him to rise to the top against all the odds, not once but twice. Now there is a lot of detail in my book and you'll be very glad to know that I'm not going to go into uh, all of that detail. I'm just going to talk about three aspects of his youth which I think shaped his personality and they are his parentage, his upbringing and his education. And I'll then give you three pivotal moments in the first half of his life where I think you can see that personality in action. And they are the rising, the treaty, and the climb back to power after the Civil War. So let's start at the beginning uh, with his parents. Uh, the facts about de Valera's parentage and about whether his parents were married are a bit of a mystery. Um, now, who someone's parents are and whether they were married or not is of no great concern uh, to us or to our assessment of that person. But the important point to bear in mind here is that the question marks greatly bothered Eamon de Valera himself. And he made many efforts over many decades in various parts of the United States and in Europe to try to find the evidence that would prove that his mother had been telling the truth about his father and about their marriage. So let's look at her story first, Kate Call, uh, a young woman from rural County Limerick, emigrated to the United States in 1879. And we know that for a fact. Uh, because her name appears on the passenger list for a ship arriving uh, in New York. And she worked uh, first in domestic service in Brooklyn, and we know that for a fact because she's listed on the 1880 census, which gives her occupation and so on. But after that, uh, we have to rely on her story, which is that she met a young Spanish man called <coughs> Vivian de Valera and that they got married in 1881. Now, there's no record of Vivian in the census um, or in any other record that's been found to date and there's no record of their marriage uh, in the church she identified or any other church in that area of New Jersey or in uh, New York City itself. We know for a fact, no, isn't he cute? We know for a fact that uh, Eamon or Edward de Valera was born on the 14th of October 1882 because there's a birth certificate and that he was baptised in the Church of St Agnes in Manhattan uh, the following December because there's a baptismal certificate. And although there is confusion in both about the spelling of the surname, which is given as de Valero, and about his own first name, which was given as George, and then that was crossed out and Edward was written in instead, both do name Vivian as his father. Then we're back to Kate Call de Valera's word again because she says Vivian had to go west because of his health and that he died in Denver or New Mexico or possibly Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> now again, there's no record of his death in any of those places and his widow was unable to produce a single letter or anything else he had written during their marriage. Now, 
absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And it's quite possible that Kate's story is absolutely true, and it's just a coincidence that there are no records. But the problem with it is that Kate wasn't a particularly um, reliable witness, shall I say. Um, at one point, she wrote to De Valera, who'd been asking questions about his father, please excuse me if I contradict anything I have told you, it is because I forget, or was not really sure of it. Now, even a dutiful son with a, a very pressing need to believe what his mother was telling him might have found that a little bit less than convincing. Does it matter? Well, I think it had an effect on De Valera's personality. He had questions about his identity that were never answered to his satisfaction. And this, I think, was part of the reason um, that he needed to identify so strongly with the Irish language and with Irish nationality. It, it's striking. People have commented on how many um, advanced nationalists at that time had at least one non-Irish parent, Patrick Pearce, Maud Gaughan, Cottle Brewer, Erskine Childers, and, of course, Eamon de Valera. So that's the parentage issue. Then there's the upbringing issue, which happened not in New York, but back in Ireland, in this house in Brewery. Uh, one of the first things Kate Gall did after hearing that her husband had died was to send her then two-and-a-half-year-old son back to Limerick to be cared for by her mother, his grandmother. There you are now. Angelic looking. And partly this was due to the fact that her brother happened to be going back to Ireland and uh, could bring him. And it wouldn't have been that uncommon at the time for children to be raised for their grandparents. What's perhaps less understandable is why when Kate remarried and had two more children, she didn't reunite the family. She didn't bring Eamon back to the United States. How did he feel about it? Not very happy, uh, would be the answer. I came across a letter he wrote to his half-brother, Tom, the son of her second marriage, when De Valera was just about to turn 20 and Tom was 12. Now, Tom had um, just gone away to boarding school. He was training to be a priest, and he must have mentioned feeling homesick. Uh, now, this is what his older half-brother wrote to him. You have had a privilege heretofore, which, member, which numbers have not had. You have been always near a loving mother. Others who may have almost as much love as yours have to live separated by the ocean from her they love. You can see mother on your vacations. I must be content with the hope to see her one day. So then try and be happy. Now, to me, that reads like someone who resents the fact that he's been raised far from his mother. And he hinted at that resentment again in a, a letter to his mother three years later. Mother, you will think it strange, but every time I hear others talking of their mothers, I feel more or less an orphan. Fate has been rather hard on us. I know how much better I would be had I been under your softening influence, and perhaps I too could have made your path less difficult had I been with you. Now, there are suggestions that Kate tried to bring de Valera back to the States uh, when he was a little bit older, and that her mother... Uh, persuaded her not to, but the only evidence I could find of any suggestion of him going to the States was in 1896 he wrote to his aunt Hanny, asking her to persuade his mother um, to ask for him to be sent to America. And he wrote, I'm going to school regularly and uncle is as kind as ever still. I am not content here. I would by far rather to be over as I have no one to be with. Uh, however, there's no indication of any follow-up, and young Eddie de Valera was left in Brewery, and in his time there, his circle of emotional support contracted. His uncle Edward, he was the one that brought him over to, the, uh, to Ireland, went back to the States. His aunt Hanny, uh, who was very close to him, uh, followed a couple of years later. His grandmother died in 1895 when he was 12, which left him in the charge of his uncle Pat, who seemed to have been um, quite stern and was certainly keen on getting young Eddie uh, to help out on the farm, which was reasonable enough. Now, if you've been to Brewery, uh, you'll know a bit out of focus. Everybody. You'll know it's a very attractive village, lovely stone uh, bridge over the river, a couple of ruined castles, very rich history. Uh, and in later life, De Valera uh, was prone to romanticise the place and loved to tell stories about his boyhood there. But the reality was a bit different. Um, the Cole family were relatively badly off. They had a government-supplied labourers' cottage, as you see here, on half an acre of land. And if you look at the, um, the average land valuations in the county, they were in the bottom 10%. Um, and De Valera himself seems to have led a fairly solitary life. Uh, here's how he recalled it. What I liked best was playing Robinson Crusoe. I remember reading the book while I minded cows. I had no one to play with. I was alone a good deal. In the river I had a little island, and I used to shape it and make plans about it. This was Ireland, and I was the ruler of it. <laughs> now, apart from the incipient uh, megalomania, it sounds, it sounds like a lonely and an isolated uh, existence without much prospect for advancement. 
So it was natural enough that he wanted to get out of there, uh, just like his mother. But while she escaped with the, through the emigrant boat, his escape would be through education. De Valera insisted on going to secondary school, which was quite rare at the time for people of his background, and he eventually made his uncle Pat give in his first real battle and his first victory. Now, the school he went to in um, Charleville in North Cork was seven miles away from the house uh, in Brewery, which left De Valera with a lo- very long walk in the evenings because he'd promised his uncle as part of the arrangement that he'd only have to pay the train fare one way. So he got the train there in the, in the morning and, and, and walked back. But despite that, which was uh, um, you know, time consuming and a bit of an obstacle to it, he did brilliantly in the junior grade of the intermediate exam, uh, which is the equivalent of the junior cert today. And he was first in his school and came 50th in the entire country. And the point about exams in those days was that the uh, successful students won what were called exhibitions, which were monetary prizes, which could be used to pay for further education. Uh, De Valera won £20 a year for three years, which paid for his escape from Brewery to Blackrock College. And you can see him there. He's uh, holding a book... uh, as the photograph is taken, but he's been very careful not to lose his place in the book. As you can see, he's got his finger stuck in it. So, while well, the other boys are more interested in football, um, our hero is uh, is interested in his studies. And he uh, recalled about it, no more long trudges over the interminable distance from Charleville, no more chopping of turnips for the cows, or the drawing of water, or the attempts to do my lessons in the intervals. Um, and that escape was down to sheer determination. That determination, that single-mindedness and that belief in his own judgment uh, that would serve him well in his uh, political career. Uh, Blackrock College, a very uh, big step up the social scale for a boy from a labourer's cottage in rural County Limerick. On his first night there, he heard boys in the dormitory crying from homesickness and he couldn't understand why they were upset. Because as far as he was concerned, this was heaven. Uh, No farm chores, unlimited time for study and even a new identity. Edward de Valera, rock man. And although there were some wobbles in the relationship, he remained a rock man to his dying day, choosing to live, choosing to die in the vicinity of the college, sending his sons there and um, being almost obsessive in attending school functions uh, in later life. Now, it wasn't all um, rosy. There were a few twists in the the tale. um, Because being at Black Rock uh, didn't remove his insecurities. They intensified them. And this was largely due to the fact that he didn't do as well in his exams as he had expected and hoped. It wasn't immediately apparent. He, he did very well at the end of his first year in Black Rock, won another exhibition for another couple of years. But after that, his results got worse and worse. And they weren't bad, per se. Um, they just weren't brilliant. And it culminated in a very disappointing pass degree when he sat his BA finals. Now, he hinted at this insecurity in a lecture he gave to the College Debating Society in 1903 on the subject of the university question, the question of whether there should be a separate university acceptable uh, to Catholics. And this lecture has been quoted quite a bit because it shows his attitude to a, um, an important political question. But what I found really interesting um, was a paragraph that, that hasn't been much noticed in which he talks about the intermediate system and exhibitions and the lack of prospects he evidently saw for himself. It is heartless cruelty worthy of some devilish ingenuity to bring a youth up from a low station, as the intermediate often does, and when he's learned to form ideas beyond his class, when he's learned enough to develop taste and to be fired, it may be with noble ambitions, then only to disillusion him and place him where to advance is impossible and to go back out of the question. Now, who on earth could he have been talking about? (laughs) One wonders. Um, Now, that was written in 1903. Uh, The following year, he sat his BA finals and got that past degree. Uh, with disappointing results. In the meantime, he'd gone to Rockwell, uh, Black Rock Sister College, to teach, and the past degree left him in a bit of a quandary because it wasn't enough to give him a career in academia. He wouldn't get a job as a lecturer in a university. But it was enough to allow him to stay at Rockwell as a teacher, and he was enjoying his time there. He was playing rugby. He was very good at it. He had a good group of friends. He enjoyed the uh, rural pursuits around Rockwell, shooting and fishing and all that sort of stuff. Um, But... uh, But that wasn't enough for Eamon de Valera, who wanted more out of life than being an obscure teacher. Now, he wrote this letter uh, to Tom, his half-brother in 1902, giving him advice. Be on your guard against daydreaming, imagining yourself in very glorious positions. It seems a very innocent pleasure, but in my case, it has been the chief method Satan has employed to disturb my peace of soul and make me waver. Obviously, we are dealing here with a young man with a certain amount of ambition. 
Um, so in the summer of 1905, he gave up his job in Rockwell and came back to Dublin, enrolled in Trinity in an unsuccessful attempt to win a scholarship to pay for his studies there, picked up part-time teaching jobs where he could. Um, a difficult existence, uh, never sure that he was going to have employment uh, the week after next. And he described it in a letter to his mother as a hard battle which he had to fight. But he did manage to make a career for himself, finally landing a permanent post at the Teacher Training College in Carysville Avenue in Black Rock in September 1906, which gave him a steady income and also allowed him to call himself Professor which he seemed to like quite a lot. Um, and he was still teaching there along with other places uh, when he was jailed in 1916. Teaching also led him to Irish uh, because there was pressure on for teachers to know the Ar language, which gave him a new name, Eamon, and a wife, Sinead, who had been his teacher in a Gaelic League uh, class. That's the picture taken on their wedding day. So by the time he turned 30 in October 1912, he was married with two young children, another one on the way. He was firmly ensconced in the middle class with a teaching job at Carysford and a temporary position, um, a temporary university post in Maynooth. And he had a consuming interest in Irish, which gave him a cause to pursue. And he had got there, remember the background, remember how far he travelled. He got there because of his determination, because of his self-reliance, character traits that were strongly reinforced by his background. The question marks over his parentage made him, I think, much more open to identifying himself with institutions or causes. Blackrock College was one, the Irish language was another, which gave him a new identity. The separation from his mother and his tough and rather isolated upbringing in Brewery made him self-reliant, determined to follow his own line. And the insecurity, which was magnified by his poor exam results and difficulty in finding a job and a position in life, made him ultra-sensitive to opposition. So, how did this play out in his career? I'm going to look at three pivotal events in de Valera's career. The rising, the treaty, and the climb back to power after the Civil War. And we'll start with the rising, because without 1916, de Valera would never have had the career he had. It gave him a prominence he'd never had before, and it also removed other potential leadership candidates. Now, this photograph was taken in 1915. It's the organising committee for the funeral uh, of, Don of Donovan Ross. So there's Tom Clark there. Um, Arthur Griffith is there somewhere, but there's Dev <coughs> up at the back, um, very recognisable, but as you can see, on the fringes of power, on the periphery, not yet uh, at the centre. At the time, he was the adjutant of the Dublin Brigade of the Volunteers, which is why he's in that, that photograph. More importantly for his future career, he was also uh, one of four battalion commandants in Dublin, and in the rising, he commanded the garrison at Boland's Bakery not at Boland's Mills, as is frequently and wrongly stated. Now, as uh, an officer, all of his subordinates testified to how well prepared he was. He knew exactly where each unit should position itself. He knew where they would find water and the tools they would need to build barricades. He knew what they would need to bring with them. And many members of the garrison recalled his inspirational leadership. So far, so good. But there have been persistent rumours that he had some kind of a breakdown uh, during the week. And there does seem to be a, a, a good basis to, the, to this uh, idea of a near breakdown. Now, it wasn't due to cowardice or shell shock, as some people claimed de Valera never lacked physical courage. It was simply due to the fact that he refused to delegate or to rest for long enough. He became overtired and he issued orders, orders which seemed to have been uh, irrational. Consider the account of company commander Simon Donnelly. Commandant de Valera had been a real live wire from the first moment we entered the position. He was forever on the move, ignoring danger, and as a matter of fact, to my mind, taking unnecessary risks. On the Friday, he presented a very worn and tired out appearance, and in spite of several requests from different officers for him to take some rest, he declined to do so. Now, unlike some of de Valera's other critics, Donnelly had no Civil War axe to grind. He was on the same side in the Civil War as de Valera. So was Joseph O'Connor, who was de Valera's second in command. And he said, at no time up to Thursday did I receive any order or hold any discussion with the commandant that wasn't in perfect order and clear with precise instructions as to what he required to be done. In other words, he clearly implies the same wasn't true from Thursday on. So why did he fail to delegate? There, there he is there in the... Uh, being marched off to capac uh, captivity. Why did he fail to delegate? There's three reasons. One was his own characteristic belief that nobody else could be trusted to do the job properly. 
Um, another was the loss of several senior officers who followed Owen McNeill's countermand in order. The third might, might be the most interesting. Um, six weeks before the rising, the Volunteers Chief of Inspection, Ginger O'Connell, wrote a report about the Dublin Brigade in which he said the 2nd Battalion had the highest standard of command, while the 1st and the 4th had a good level, but the 3rd, that's de Valera's battalion, was much the weakest in the matter of command. The number of officers is now down to a minimum, and the quality of the NCOs is not good. If new officers are to be appointed, it will not be at all easy to find them within the battalion. Now, he didn't blame de Valera for this. He said the shortage of qualified officers was due to unavoidable circumstances. But that's a pretty damning verdict of de Valera's uh, subordinate. So if he didn't trust them to do the job properly, he might have had uh, a reason for doing so. But the most important thing de Valera did in 1916 was quite simple. He survived. Um, and that was entirely due to luck. It had nothing to do with him being born in America, which is the story you frequently hear. For instance, Tom Clark was actually an American citizen, uh, but he was executed. And Thomas Ashe, who wasn't American, was tried on the same day as de Valera, and he was spared. So it was all to do with timing. Um, after surrendering, the 3rd Battalion was taken to the RDS and kept there for two days before being transferred to Richmond Barracks, which is where this photograph was taken, where there was already a queue waiting for court-martial. So de Valera went to the back of the queue, and by the time he was court-martialed, public opinion had swung against the executions, and his death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. Now, being a leading figure in the Rising helped to make him a leader of the prisoners uh, in various jails in Britain. Being leader of the prisoners made him the candidate in the East Clare by-election. Uh, winning East Clare made him the perfect candidate to become leader of the new Sinn Féin party in October 1917. When I say new Sinn Féin party, it incorporated Arthur Griffith's original Sinn Féin, it incorporated Plunkett's Liberty League, it incorporated lots of uh, members of the volunteers, Republicans of various kinds. It was, in essence, a coalition between advanced Republicans and more moderate nationalists. De Valera's unique contribution was the formula that Sinn Féin would seek a republic and then decide afterwards what form of government an independent Ireland should have. That kept everyone from Cahill Brewer to Arthur Griffith in harness and working together for the time being. Um, a quick word about De Valera's leadership. He was elected unopposed and he very quickly became used to being obeyed without question. When he went to America uh, during the War of Independence, he was the subject of unprecedented adulation, which must have been a huge boost to his ego, particularly because it was all done in the full view of his mother, who can be seen in this photograph. She's actually listening to a recording of one of his speeches. And whose photograph does she have up on the wall? Her favourite son. So uh, whatever feelings of rejection he might have had, you can see how the trip to America uh, might have helped to heal them. But um, he also faced opposition from some Irish-American leaders, which had the opposite effect. It accentuated the insecurity from his youth, which is the only explanation for the uh, rather irrational lengths he went to in order to defeat those rivals. When he returned to Ireland at the end of 1920, Griffith thought he had changed, describing him as a good man who had been ruined by America, while Collins seems to have been irritated by his long and repetitious yarns about his American travels. On one occasion when de Valera began an anecdote, Collins pointed out that they'd already heard it two or three times before and they didn't need to hear it again, thank you very much. <laughs> so now we come to the treaty. Um, a truce was agreed with the British, de Valera met Lloyd George in London, the two sides stated their case and then talks began in London. Um, I would argue that de Valera made three mistakes in his handling of those talks. The first was he refused to go himself. Um, this decision became very controversial and de Valera spent the rest of his life justifying it, arguing his case with historians in particular. Any historian who made the mistake of going up to the RS was sure to get a very long uh, and invo uh, involved and detailed explanation. And he did have good arguments to make. By staying in Dublin, the plenipotentiaries would have to report back, which slowed down the pace of the talk, so in theory the British uh, couldn't bounce them into an agreement. Um, it would also allow de Valera to intervene if the talks broke down and possibly rescue a deal at the last moment. But it's difficult to ignore the argument that W.T. Cosgrave made at the time. This was a team they were sending over and they were leaving their ablest player in reserve. Um, put simply, uh, de Valera was painstaking, he could be pedantic, he may well have driven everybody in London mad, but he wouldn't have made some of the mistakes that Arthur Griffith 
uh, made during the course of the talks. Um, he, he should have gone, and it's very significant that he never made that mistake again. Any time there were important negotiations to be done, he made sure he was the man that was doing them. Um, the second mistake he made was he thought he could control the delegation from Dublin. Um, they were given plenipotentiary powers, which meant they had the right to reach an agreement. But they were also given secret instructions from the cabinet. You can see those uh, upstairs. Trevor was showing to me, them to me earlier. Um, that before they reached decisions, they had to uh, report back to Dublin and wait for a reply from Dublin. Now, there, those instructions are sometimes seen as an assurance that nothing would be signed in London that hadn't been approved at home. But while this might have been de Valera's intention, it wasn't what the instructions stated. All they had to do was get the views of their colleagues before they used their full powers to conclude a treaty. The third mistake I think he made was to send the delegates back to London for the last round of the talks without a clear idea of what they were seeking. Um, the final cabinet meeting on December 3rd lasted a full day and it seems to have been uh, a bit chaotic and the fault for that obviously has to lie with the man who chaired it which was de Valera. The meeting decided that the delegation should return to London and say they couldn't accept the oath of allegiance in the British draft if not amended which, of course, implies that they could accept an amended version. Now, that doesn't appear to have been what uh, de Valera's understanding of it, but that's what they thought uh, they'd been told. So it's not a surprise that there were lots of recriminations afterwards. Um, we needn't concern ourselves with what happened in London, which is well enough known, uh, the pressure from Lloyd George, the threat of immediate and terrible war, the final reluctant agreement of all five plenipotentiaries to sign. But what about de Valera's reaction? He was down in Limerick, which is where this... Uh, Photograph was taken, there he is there, obviously. Uh, Cahill Brewer, Dick Mulcahy up at the back. Um, that's uh, St Stephen O'Mara, the former Parnellite uh, MP. So he was in Limerick. He, he, uh, there's some confusion about exactly when uh, he heard that a treaty had been signed, but he certainly knew by the time he got back to Dublin uh, at lunchtime on the 6th of December. And what he did then was curious. He had lunch in his office. He drove out to Greystones to visit his family. Uh, then he drove back into Dublin to an event at the Mansion House and made no effort to find out what agreement had actually been signed. Um, when he was shown a copy of the Mansion House, he seemed more put out that it had been signed without his prior approval than upset at the contents. This and his subsequent behaviour has led to accusations that he was acting out of peak rather than principle. There's something in that, but there's more to it, uh, I think. He still believed, even at this stage, that the British could be made to accept external association, which is his idea that Ireland would be outside of the Commonwealth but associated with it. And he felt that there was still a chance uh, of getting that agreement and he knew that it was the only way to keep uh, hardline Republicans like Cahill Brewer uh, on side. So external association was the only way to avoid a damaging split. Uh, so he thought it was worthwhile keeping it as an objective, get the cabinet and the doll to reject the treaty, then present the British with an alternative. And that strategy had some merit until the treaty was accepted by a majority of the cabinet and a majority of the Dáil. At that point, de Valera's opposition became counterproductive and contributed to the increasing polarisation that led to the Civil War. Um, throughout his career, he would pretend that he was a reluctant politician and he would that he would prefer to go back to teaching maths. And occasionally, he was honest enough to admit in, uh, the truth in private. As he put it to uh, Dorothy McArdle in a revealing conversation in the 1930s, it is extraordinary the change that occurs once people are in office. I see it in myself, I watch it. Once you are satisfied that the welfare of the country is served by your retaining power, you get impatient of all opposition, inclined to think it is all factions. You could probably put that quote in the mouth of every single political leader there has ever been ever, anywhere, but it's significant uh, that de Valera said it. And in December 1921, he certainly believed that the welfare of Ireland would be served by him retaining power. His impatience of opposition was evident, and he accused the other side of introducing party politics into the doll. To him, all opposition was the result of ill will, bad faith, and the workings of cabals, and therefore no compromise was possible. Allies must be found to defeat the conspiracy. The good fight had to be fought until victory, and that was a dangerous approach in a combustible situation. His most infamous contribution to the ramping up of tension was a speech in Thurlis on St. Patrick's Day, uh, 1922. If the volunteers of the future tried to complete the work the volunteers of the last four years have been attempting, they would have to complete it not over the bodies of foreign soldiers, 
but over the dead bodies of their own countrymen. They would have to wade through Irish blood, through the blood of the soldiers of the Irish government, and through perhaps the blood of some of the members of the government in order to get Irish freedom. Then he headed to Killarney the next day, where he delivered another inflammatory speech, this time with direct encouragement to action. If our volunteers continue, and I hope they will continue, until the goal is reached, and we suppose this treaty is ratified by our votes, then these men, in order to achieve free freedom, will have, I said yesterday, to march over the dead bodies of their own brothers. They will have to wade through Irish blood. If you don't want that, don't put up that barrier. Now, opponents claimed this was incitement. Supporters said it was a warning rather than a threat. In either case, it didn't help the situation. In fairness, there would have been a civil war uh, with or without de Valera. The militants, Rory O'Connor uh, and so on in, in the four courts, paid very little attention to him in reality. But the point is, it would have been much smaller and much shorter without his support. De Valera himself acknowledged that he was a reluctant leader of the extremists, describing himself as a fish out of water in the role. I urge them to choose someone whose manner of thought and general character was more in consonance with their own. I believe they would have done better had they taken my advice, but they neither did that, nor did they really go in the direction I would have taken them. As you know, he eventually persuaded the IRA to dump arms and was arrested and imprisoned for a year by the Free State Government, who wanted to put him on trial, but um, were a bit embarrassed to discover that there wasn't any evidence on which to frame a charge, with, but um, they locked him up for a year anyway. So partly through tactical ineptitude, partly through a refusal to admit he'd been beaten, de Valera found himself the captive rather than the leader of the extremists, and had probably the most miserable time of his life during the Civil War, an observer rather than a controller of events. But it was precisely this stubbornness that fueled his most amazing achievement, coming back from the political dead. He started off by insisting on reviving the Sinn Féin party. Now, a lot of Republicans were opposed. They thought the name was bankrupt, uh, that it had been contaminated by the free status. But de Valera had a different view. Our aim is not to make a close preserve for ourselves, but to win the majority of the people again. I understand the difficulties, but we must teach our people to be broad in this matter. So he wanted to cast the net as widely as possible, to win over as many people as possible. This was not a man who would be content with leading a die-hard rump, but that's where he found himself. Sinn Féin was abstentionist. When he suggested that once the oath was gone, attending the doll was a matter of tactics rather than principle, he found more opposition within the party than he liked. When his policy change was narrowly defeated at the Sinn Féin Ardesh in March 1926, he announced his resignation. Now, de Valera always claimed uh, that as he walked out of the Sinn Féin Ardesh, he was walking away from politics until he was persuaded by Sean Lamas that he couldn't turn his back on his life's work and was persuaded to uh, maintain his, uh, retain his political career. Um, I'm not sure that anyone ever really believed that. Uh, I think he was quite keen on continuing his career. Within a matter of days, he was operating out of a new office in O'Connell Street with, as he put it, no furniture, no light, no money. That didn't last long. Uh, money started to flow in from his loyal supporters in America and the organisational uh, effort uh, of people like Jerry Boland, Sean Lamas, uh, Sean McEntee is, is well known and, and famous. But what was he going to do? Was he going into Dáil Éireann? Was he going to take the oath? His opponents who remained in Sinn Féin believed that was his intention all along, but he denied that and he continued giving hostages to fortune when Dan Breen, of all people, decided to take the oath, de Valera was absolutely downright. If there are any people who think that I or any of those associated with me will be brought to take the oath, they are deceiving themselves. Neither I nor any member of Fianna Fáil will ever take that oath. That is final and I hope it is clear. Well, it was clear, but it wasn't final. <laughs> because things changed. Um, after the murder of Kevin O'Higgins, new laws made it mandatory on election candidates to agree to take the oath. It was an oath to take the oath, if you like. W.T. Cosgrave was offering de Valera a choice. You can swallow your words, or you can give up politics. Now, it shouldn't be thought that de Valera grabbed this as an excuse to change policy, much as some of his supporters like Lamas, like Boland, might have liked. In fact, he dithered. He blew hot and cold on the idea of enter entering the door, and he gave conflicting signals. Eventually, he got over the fact that he was making a massive change in policy by denying that it was any change at all. The oath wasn't an oath 
but was merely an empty political formula which deputies could conscientiously sign without becoming involved or without involving their nation in obligations of loyalty to the English crown. So de Valera went to Leinster House and before he signed the book signifying that he accepted the oath in the treaty, he read out a statement in Irish, I am not prepared to take an oath, I am not going to take an oath, I am prepared to put my name down in this book in order to get permission to go into the doll, but it has no other significance. He then took the Bible off the table and left it on a couch by the door, covered the text of the oath with a, a bit of paper he was carrying and signed the book, stating that one day he would see that that book was burnt. So why did he do it? There was the legislation introduced by Cosgrave, there was pressure from within Fianna Fáil and there was the possibility of joining forces with Labour and the National League to vote the government out. But in fairness to him, there had also been a change in the way the oath uh, was administered. Back in 1922, TDs had to stand up at the Dáil Chamber and recite the oath in public. Now all it required was a signature to a book in a private room. Maybe it really was only an empty formula. But he still had a guilty conscience, as he made clear in a speech a few days later. I grant that what we did was contrary to all our former actions and to everything we stood for, contrary to our declared policy and to the explicit pledges we gave at the time of our election. It was a step painful and humiliating for us who had to take it and for those who had supported us. Still, that it was our duty to take the step became increasingly clear as the situation was examined. So while he claimed he hadn't really taken the oath, he clearly realised that he had broken his word. He was now inside the Free State Parliament that he had taken up arms to oppose. And while W.T. Cosgrave had succeeded in forcing de Valera into the Dáil, he'd also signed his own political death warrant. De Valera continued to build up Fianna Fáil and, equally importantly, established his own newspaper, The Irish Press, which played a big part in his election victory in 1932. Exactly ten years and two months after he resigned the presidency after the treaty vote, de Valera was elected back to power as president of the Executive Council at the head of the Fianna Fáil minority government with Labour support. In his decade in the wilderness, he'd been a reluctant soldier, a defeated rebel, a despised prisoner. He had rebuilt a political party and then split it when he failed to get his way. He had founded another political movement as well as a national newspaper. He had led his followers from the margins to the centre of the free state political system by taking an oath he had sworn never to take. And he had repeatedly defied predictions that he was finished. It was an even more astonishing achievement, considering it was his second rise against seemingly insurmountable odds. The first from obscurity to national leadership in 1917. His second from the disaster of the Civil War to government in 1932. How did he do it? What gave him the drive to overcome seemingly impossible odds? As I've said, I think at least part of the answer lies in his background, the sense of insecurity that came from the question marks over his parentage, his abandonment by his mother, his precarious hold on the middle class through Blackrock College, gave him the drive to want to seize leadership and hold on to it. This had pros and it had cons. It contributed to the Civil War, but it also drove him to return from the depths after the defeat, to become once again the leader of Irish nationalism.